Well, welcome everyone to this week's Hater Talk. Uh, this is another great week where we have the opportunity to hear and learn um, from another distinguished and good researcher that we could work with. And so this week uh, we have Dr. Gary Secor from NDSU. And as you can see at the slide here showing up that he's gonna talk about what we know about Dickey so far. He's been working on this for a number of years and look forward to his presentation. And so don't forget, um, if you have questions, there's a Q and A box at the bottom. You can type your answer into, or your question into, and he can answer it uh, when he gets done with his presentation. And you may also raise your hand and uh, let us know if you wanna talk and we can allow you to talk. So whichever works best for you, uh, feel free. Or there's also the chat box too, that you can even send him, you know, send questions into. So anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and get this week's Tater Talk started and uh, take it away, Gary. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I like Andy's comment. Maybe we should do something a little different today. You guys top in the, uh, type in the question or the answer, and I'll try to guess the question. There used to be a show like that on TV. Uh, but anyway, good morning. I'm happy to be distinguished. Thank you for that, Andy. So I'm going to talk about kind of what we know about Dickia so far, just give an update of, uh, of our project on Dickia. Uh, so I'll start with a little history and then go through some of the findings we've got and then uh, uh, have time for questions at the end, I hope. So thanks for attending. So in, in 2017, uh, USDA and NIFA awarded uh, our group two and a half million dollars to look at management of soft rot and black leg of potatoes. The title of it is the Integrating Next Generation Technologies for Black Lake and Soft Trot Management in the USA. And the main driver of this, this grant uh, that we received was because there was a widespread outbreak of Dickia causing some field losses of table and chipping potatoes, particularly in the Eastern US. That's where the disease first started and that's where the most uh, the most serious losses were and where it was the most frequent all up and down the eastern seaboard all the way from maine down to florida really <clears throat> and it was causing losses in stand because of seed decay and black leg from some of those seed pieces that decayed not completely resulting in black leg and of course the plants died later um, this pathogen that was causing this this stand and black leg loss was uh, Dickia dianthicola, and that was that pathogen is new to the U.S. It used to be called Erwinia chrysanthemi. It was very uncommon. It's been here for about 20 years. They changed the name uh, to Dickia dianthicola, and that pathogen was new to the U.S. and increased in the incidence and the seriousness of of uh, soft rot and black leg in the U.S. This proposal and this project was widely supported by growers, by industry, and by other stakeholders. <clears throat> we received four years of funding. Year four ends in October of this year. We have an option to do a one-year extension, which we probably will do because there's obviously some unfinished projects. Main objectives, uh, improved detection identification, uh, using some molecular technology, epidemiology and spread, host resistance using omics like uh, genomics and proteomics and metalomics, metabolomics, uh, and screening for host resistance. And of course, management is a main key factor. And uh, what's the impact of economic development, uh, the economic impact of DICA infection on potato fields? Uh, the PIs are myself, Amy Tarkowski in Colorado, Jay Howe in Maine, and Chris McIntosh in Idaho. Uh, we have 10 additional scientists that you can see here uh, throughout the U.S. that are involved in this project as research scientists. I don't need to, you can read those, I don't need to see their names or to say their names. And then we have a, an advisory board from farms, commodity groups, and industry. Again, you can see their names here. Uh, some of them like uh, Don Sklarzik is semi-retired. John Norgard is retired. Milt Carter is semi-retired. 
So some of the people are in transition for our advisory board, but suffice it to say, we've got a, a pretty good advisory board for this project as well. Um, one of the things, one of the principal foci of this project is uh, detection of the bacteria in seed lots or detection of infected seed lots because Dickia and Pecto are both seed borne diseases. They're not soil borne diseases. They're poor competitors. They do not have any endospores for long term survival. So the main source of infection is infected. Or a post harvest test is necessary to detect Dickey in the seed because Dickey well late in the season. Dickey infection is usually early in the season with stand loss as an early season black leg. And it does not cause much soft rot decay in harvested potatoes. So we, in order to, uh, so the inspectors can't see, doesn't cause decay in storage. So we have to test the seed lots uh, to determine which seed lots have decay, which do not. So part of this is development of a seed lot testing. So our scientific community has developed a protocol to detect Dickey and seed. This is kind of, we have to use a PCR test. We recommend stem end cores in groups of 25 per sample. So 16 groups of 25 stem end cores, that's 400 samples. Plus we know that, uh, Dickey is also in the lettuce soles. So we collect 25 peel samples per sample as well. And the peels are one to two inches long, north to south as Norgard says. Um, and then we, we smash those samples or test those samples, the peels and stem end cores together. And we use a uh, PCR test using either PEL-ADE primers or DFDR primers for Dickia. And then we can sequence the PCR product to identify the particular species of Dickia that's present, but the primary one is dianthicola. That's, that's the primary target that we're after. Amy Tarkowski is the source of reference isolates for our testing. We've done some multi-lab testing of, of DNA, and we know that we have about a 98.6% accuracy, so that's good. We did a ring test in November of 2019 uh, with inoculated mini tubers uh, with Pecto and Dickia and both or neither. And we sent those to nine different labs as a ring test to look at the accuracy of our detection procedure. We had 100% accuracy in that Dickia. So we're pretty confident that this seed lot testing procedure or protocol that we've developed, developed actually does work pretty well. Um, but the problem we have is we only have limited results to predict the amount of field disease based on what we find in the seed lot testing results. That's become a very hard nut to crack and we're still working on that. We can't, we can't predict how much will be in the field based on what we find in the seed because the environmental uh, factors that will impact uh, the, the uh, development of disease. So this is some data that we just put together of looking at the incidence of infection by PCR testing of 316 potato seed lots collected in the US from 2017 to 2021. So you can see across the, the bottom of the table or the, the chart is the years with testing. And on the x-axis on the left-hand side is the percent positive. So we're looking at the number of lots we tested in the blue is the lots, and in the gold is the samples that were tested. So in 2017, for instance, uh, we tested 67 lots, 16.8% were positive. We tested 1,057 samples, 5.5 uh, were positive, and so on for each of the years. And you can see that the, the number of lots that were positive ranged pretty much between 10 and 15%. And the number of samples in those years ranged between 
about one and five percent. So that's been pretty consistent. Except I know somebody's going to ask the question, what happened in 2019 when we had 46% of the lots positive for Dickia? I think what happened is we did, we first found Dickia in like 2016. By the time those lots went from generation one to generation two to generation three to generation four for commercial, there was a high number of seed lots. And with continued testing, we were able to get rid of those seed lots and now we're back to our normal low levels of seed lots. Uh, and we're still testing this year. So the results from 2021 are as of March 1st of this year. But it looks like we have a pretty, pretty good test, pretty even distribution of seed lots over the over that time period from 17 to 21. Um, in addition to some screening, we tested one large uh seed lot in 2020 with 42 diverse seed lots 472 samples zero positives so it looks like we're making headway of of getting rid of infected seed lots our diagnostic lab at ndsu has tested 94 lots so far this year none of them have been positive so that's kind of good news that we're making headway on using seed lot testing to eliminate uh infected seed lots uh, it, it does seem that Dickia as a cause of seed decay and black leg is declining in importance, but Pectobacterium continues to be important. And especially the emergence of Pectobacterium parmentiri, this appears to be a more serious cause of storage soft rot. It seems to be pretty aggressive. It seems to be really important in storage soft rot, especially in the Eastern US, okay? So there are some practical aspects of this seed testing results. Uh, we worked with a large farming operation and tested a number of samples from them uh, using our standard procedure. 11.2% uh, of the samples tested positive for Dickia in 2019. The range was from zero to 16 of 16 samples. 12, about half of the seed lots were free of Dickia. And in the field, the 100% sample, the 16 of 16, had less than a 50% stand. So we know that the higher the infection level in a seed lot, the greater the stand up to 50%. Here's some anecdotal grower observations from that study uh, that this group rejected the highly infected seed lots. Okay? And in general, they observed that uh, any seed lot that has three of the 16 samples positive is considered a problem, okay? So they will have to work with that seed lot or plant it in a special location or in an area where Dickey is not common. Anyway, it's, it's, it's considered a problem. They need to deal with it. Seed from two states have the highest incidence. One of the states was completely clean and did not have any dick at all. And da da da, -da that state was North Dakota. So you growers from North Dakota that produce seed, keep going to church. You got a good deal going on. We didn't find any seed lots with, with Dickia from North Dakota. Uh, positive samples seem to be more related to a farm source than variety. And there is no variety specificity. In other words, uh, we don't find any resistant varieties or any differences in varieties. So not all strains of Dianticola are uh, it can be detected by this general test using the primers that we have. So we've had to identify some additional tests you can see in these publications to identify some dianthicola lots that are not detected. So for instance, this strain that went from Wisconsin to De Texas uh, differed in the strains from Maine and it lacks the, the, the site for the DNA, DIA primer. So it, it escapes detection if you use this PCR assay. So we're aware of that. We need to be careful that we don't get new strains. It's kind of like, kind of like our friend COVID. We get new strains, they may not be, be detected like the vaccine may not work. So we do have some genetic variability starting to show up in the, some of these strains of Dickia. We also want to know how Dickia spreads. We know we can inoculate Dickia by infiltration or needle puncture. Uh, so we did a trial in Florida, North Dakota, inoculating seed. 
we had significant differences in reduction of stand in Florida, but not in North Dakota. And I think the environment in Florida and the moisture was much more favorable for disease than it was in North Dakota. So one of the things we asked, does the concentration of dickia in the seed tuber impact seed decay? In other words, if there's a lot of bacteria in the seed versus a little amount of bacteria, does that impact seed decay? And this was a thesis work of Cal Larson. He inoculated seed with different con or with increasing concentrations of dickia from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 9. So 10 to the 4 is 10,000. And we planted those in Florida and North Dakota. We did not find a significant difference in emergent plant height yield tuber infection by dickia. So we conclude that the concentration of dickia has minimal impact on disease or growth of the potatoes. So really, the concentration of dickia is not, does not seem to be important. But another trial, this dickia is spread in the field. And we had two trials uh, in Florida and Oaks, North Dakota. This was the thesis work of Blake Greiner, who got his master's degree here. And we inoculated seed with dickia by vacuum infiltration. And we surrounded those by not inoculated seed that was tested and shown to be free of dickia. So the red illustrates the, the planting, the red illustrates the infected seed piece. And it was surrounded on all four sides, illustrated in blue of seed free of dickia. Okay. And we let the, and then it grow, grew full season long. We did not have stand or black leg during the season, but we collected tubers from progeny tubers of each site surrounding the positive plant and tested those for um, PCR by, uh, tested those for Dickia by PCR. So we collected four tubers from each of the, each of the plants surrounding each of these seed pieces, okay? The infection rate by PCR was 33% in Florida and 13% in North Dakota. This is pretty comparable to a similar trial done in Netherlands by Vanderwolf that he found infection of 27%. So we know that Dickia can move from the infected seed piece to the progeny tubers in, in the soil moisture, okay? We replanted those dickey infected tubers the next year, had a 94% stand in Florida, 99% stand in North Dakota. So we also know that dickey can infect those progeny tubers without symptoms, and they can be infected and not show symptoms the next year. And we assume that that bacteria is moving in the soil moisture. So we think that's how dickey can spread between seed lots, it can infect without causing any symptoms. Uh, so the third trial we did for spread is Dickey is spread by seed cutting, okay? And my colleague, Steve Johnson, whose photo is here, observed that Dickey wasn't transmitted during seed potato handling and cutting. So we did some trials in 17, 18, and 19, a plot trial in 17 uh, by mixing uh, Dickey inoculated seed with healthy seed and then handled, cut, and planted those potatoes uh, together, but uh, we handled and cut them together, but planted them separately. So we could observe for the amount of disease in the field. In 2017, uh, 2017, it was a plot trial in Florida. We did not see any stand loss, no spread to healthy seed. <coughs> of course, a lot of the growers said, well, that was a plot trial. What happens if you do it on a commercial level? So we did a commercial trial in Florida, 200 pounds of seed inoculated with dianthicola, a mixed with commercial, mixed with 2,500 pounds of healthy seed and commercially cut. We did not see a stand loss in that healthy planted seed, but when we planted the inoculated seed, we had a 90% stand loss, okay? So we didn't have any spread there. Again, we did a replicated trial in 2019 in Florida and Maryland mixing healthy seed and inoculated seed. No black leg or seed decay at either site. Uh, no dickia was found by PCR testing of cores and peels from 240 progeny tubers in Maryland. Okay, so we tested the seed. We didn't see disease. We didn't see spread of the bacteria 
into that into the project progeny into the the cut seed during that cutting and handling and we saw no difference in yield and grade now this study had just been published in the american potato journal or the american journal of potato research that shows how old i am american potato journal and it's this has been published in its it's january uh, of 2021 in the American Potato Journal, volume 98, 64 to 71, if you want to look at this study in greater detail. Um, we're also looking at pathogen diagnostics and population stru uh, structure, okay? Uh, Brian Swingle in New York, um, in 2016 and 17, found that, that black leg in New York was equally caused by dianthicola or dickia and pectobacterium. And the dickia had very little genetic diversity, which is consistent with a recent introduction. So that shows that it might've been introduced recently. The pectobacterium are much more diverse, consistent with a long-term endemic population that's been around for a long time. And they've done genome sequencing of pectobacterium and Dickia dianthicola. So those have been, we know that we know the, 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 geno the genome sequence of those. And you can see he looked at one called Pectobacterium maceratum. So this is the new Pectobacterium, okay? Ken Frost in Oregon looked at the distribution of Keratovarum and Dickia in Oregon. Okay, so he found Keratovarum atraseptacum, Parmentiri, which was not previously reported in Oregon, but only a little bit of Dickia, only 3% of the black leg there. Jay Howe looked at the population in Maine and showed that the population is a little bit different than the European populations, and southern states don't have the exact population as Maine. He also showed that there was an interaction between our friend Dianthicola and our friend Pectobacterium parmentiri. And disease severity is greater with co-infection than either one alone. So there's some synergism going on between Dickia and Pectobacterium that makes disease worse. And he found that there are three clades of Dianthicola in the Northeastern US. And the cause of that outbreak, which we've always said has been started in Maine, may be a, a, an, a, associated with one of these new strains that was derived by, for, by mutation. So we still don't know whether this new Dickia came as an introduction from say Europe or it was derived or it was caused by a mutation. So we've got two lines of evidence for that, if you will. We're also screening germplasm for resistance. We're doing traditional testing of uh, processing varieties using tuber inoculation. And you can see that uh, in this population from U uh, Potatoes USA, that we have a lot of, of variability in susceptibility, but we don't have resistance. But this is not a really good test to use because Dickia is not a good, Dickia is not a good tuber pathogen, but Pectobacterium certainly is. And we test for both Dickia and Pectobacterium in our test. And Susie Thompson, as a graduate student, and I'm helping to co-advise, Eduardo Palette is looking at screening our NDSU germplasm for Dickia using petioles. Because remember, Dickia infects the plants in the field, so we're using petioles to screen for resistance to Dickia. So we're using replicated trials uh, in, the, in uh, the new greenhouse to screen, and he screened 287 genotypes. Two promising selections have been identified. And so we are using these foam, uh, flower foam cubes uh, and putting the petioles in those fresh cut and measuring the amount of rot and wilt and discoloration in the leaves to screen for resistance. So uh, it seems to be a pretty good method. Uh, so this is the basis of, of his work. We are finding some good resistance. We're also going to try screening tubers for resistance uh, with Susie's population. Uh, Brian Swingle again in Cornell is screening USG uh, potato gene bank, bank, wild species for high levels of soft rot resistance. 
he's finding some resistance in solanum microdontum. Uh, and so he's in integrating those into crossing to try to get some resistance. Adam Hoiberger at uh, Colorado State is uh, using some, remember I talked about omics, he's using some metabolomics to look for small molecules associated with resistance to dickia. And he's literally screened hundreds of molecules. And he's found some little molecules that from resistant wild potatoes that it appeared to inhibit virulence. So these could be useful as markers for resistant, for breeding for resistant potato variety. So we're making some progress there. And Melanie Filiotrol, who's USDA at Cornell, is looking at defense response of potato plants to Dickia. And she's found in the green, and you can read all of this, but the green kind of summarizes that there's a class of genes uh, called antimicrobial peptides that are hypothetically involved in resistance to soft rot pathogens. So she's got a very basic research project on uh, looking for some of these antimicrobial pep peptide. So we get a lot of work going on in developing resistance or looking for resistance to Dickia. Uh, we're also trying to look for potential sources of Dickia. This is one of my favorite stories. Uh, I ordered 20 Adalia bulbs from a well-known European mail order source in the Netherlands, okay? Four of those tested positive for Dickia, okay? So I planted those at my house in Fargo because the Dahlia flowers are so beautiful. And so we cultured and sequenced those and it showed that it was Dickia chrysanthemum, which is now Dickia dianthicola. They were pathogenic to potato, okay? This has also been reported as a source of Dickia in Australia, South Africa, and New York. So Dahlias look like those flower bulbs are a source of Dickia because they can, they are pathogenic to potato. And remember that Dickia is found in many ornamentals, especially in Florida, where they reuse their irrigation water, they recycle it, that recycles the Dickia and Pectobacterium as well. It's also found in flower bulbs, broccoli, nettles, pineapple, and likely many more hosts. So Dickia not only infects potatoes, but a lot of other crops as well. And those could be sources of Dickia and inoculum for potatoes. Jay Howe has looked at surface water because they say, is surface water a source of Dickia? Because it is for Pectobacterium. So he's found Dickia aquatica, okay, which is a new species. And Dickia zia and Dickia dianthicola have all been found in water and are all pathogenic to potato, okay? You can see the testing he's done here with inoculation of tubers, and you can see the, the uh, the lesion size based on uh, which species it is. You can see Aquatica and is, is pathogenic to potatoes, but we don't really know how important that is and whether this is a source of infection for potatoes or not. So that, that research is still ongoing. We've got our ag economists, of course, looking at the economic impact of data we did replicated trials in four states in 2019 by planting infected seed mixed with uh, infected and not infected seed at 0, 5, 10, 20%. Um, that data is done. We looked at Stan Black Lake Yielding Grade and Economic Analysis with Chris McIntosh and Kate Fuller. Uh, Chris is at University of Idaho. Kate is at Montana State. We're repeating this trial in 2021 at four locations. Again, um, one of the most important thing is communication of soft rod, black leg dickia to the industry. We've got an advisory board. We try to meet annually. Of course, this year we've had Zooms because we can't meet personally. And one of the things we hear from our uh, advisory board is management. All that other good, all the omics is good, all the spread is good. How do we manage it? They really want to know about management. So we're trying to concentrate on management as much as we can. Uh, we used to have grower seminars live, but now we've done a lot of Zoom seminars and some of you have probably participated in them, including this one. And Michigan State has even put out a YouTube. So here's some end thoughts that I have as kind of summarized where I think we are. 
Dickey is most frequently found in the eastern half of the US, far less likely to be found in the western US, probably because it's drier. We do have a good standard assay for detecting Dickey in seed lots, stem end cores and peel using a PCR test. Dickey is not spread by seed handling and cutting, at least in the trials we've done. It can spread to field by to adjacent tubers up to 33% in Florida. Dickey infection can re remain latent in seed potato tubers, not result in disease expression after planting. This is a key issue because most of the seed is planted in cool areas where it doesn't express. So you can have infection, a latent infection in seed potato tubers planted in a warm area, say like Florida or Maryland, then you can get disease expression. So that's one of the take home lessons that's really important. Several labs are screening germplasm for resistant to Dickia using different methods. There may be all kinds of sources for Dickia, as I talked about before, many that still need to be identified. And in my heart of hearts, I'm still wondering where that initial infection comes because we can make many tubers free of Dickia and Pecto. Where's that initial infection come from? That's really, it's a big question I really wanna know. And it looks like Pectobacterium populations are changing. Our friend Parmentira is becoming more important and Dickia is declining as a disease of importance. Um, a couple of families to talk about the Dickias and the Pectos. So I'm going to just talk about those quickly. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven species of Dickia so far. Okay. Dianthicola is the one that's most important in the US. Um, Aquaticus is the one found in uh, water. This one, Fengzhang Dai, is the first one of woody plants. So they can infect woody species as well. And of course, our friend Solani, which is serious in Europe, has pretty much disappeared. We don't have that in the US. Then there's a family called the Pectos, okay? Atraseptica, which causes black leg. Caratavra, which is a general soft rotter of fleshy fruits and vegetables. Brasiliens, which is not too common, but also occurs in sugar beet in North Dakota, Minnesota. And here's our new friend, Parmentira, which is the new serious one in storage. And people keep finding new pectos, uh, driving us crazy. Here's Polaris, which is a new species found in Norway, and Maceratum, which is new that goes to cabbage and potato in Russia. And I'm sure that as the, the bacteriologists get involved, we're gonna find new members of both of these two families. So. I will stop there. I think that is the end of my presentation. And I'll be happy to answer questions.